Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books in Sociology. I'm Jeff Adler, speaking today with Alessandro Cedosa, a lecturer in the Department of Marketing at the University of Birmingham. We are speaking today about Alessandro's new book, The Hipster Economy, Taste and Authenticity in Late Modern Capitalism, published by UCL Press on January 23rd, 2024, with an open access PDF version available on the web now. In the book, Alessandro sheds light on what the current popularity of craft products, be it cocktail bars, taco trucks, or craft breweries, tell us about the modern world. More broadly, Alessandro answers why a concept we hear about all the time, that of authenticity, has become so ever-present today. Alessandro, thank you for joining me. Thanks to you for inviting me today. Happy to do so. So to start, tell us what is, broadly speaking, the hipster economy and why did you decide to study it? Okay, I may have an answer to this. Let's hear it. The title of the book. Thank you. Uh, well, with hipster economy, I refer to the urban economy of small and independent businesses, uh, typically bars and restaurants, but also corner shops that base themselves on a specific aesthetic and as spe- the idea of offering to consumers a specific consuming experience. They cannot be distinguished just by being a different category because they, you know, from a pure retailing point of view, they are still bars or restaurants. But you can all, but you can uh, naturally distinguish it when you look at them. No? And this is how I started to use the hipster label in my research because basically I needed a term to say, you know. To refer to these kind of businesses which clearly distinguish themselves from the mass of other businesses for having a specific authentic aesthetic, the idea of offering a unique consumption experience which was distinctive and authentic, but it didn't have a name. And so that's why I started to use colloquially the term oh, yes, you see the kind of hipster businesses. And then everyone will tell me, oh, yes, sure, like this. And maybe I had interviewed that business one week before. No? So these are this is the hipster economy, the ensemble of these businesses that are now become ubiquitous in what we usually consider the coolest neighborhoods of basically any, I could say, middle or large city in the global north especially but also beyond the global north more in general and more broadly speaking the hipster economy is a paradigm in the consumption which influences not just urban retailing but also for example the products that we see are being sold on the shelves of the supermarket where all the products try to disguise themselves as craft, even if they're not, is the reason why, as I write in the book, uh, McDonald's has started to you know, to market their burgers as craft burgers, even if they quite failed in that. So yes, no, it is both a specific urban economy, but also more in general, this urban economy is you know, uh, the purest expression of a wider paradigm based on the ideals of authenticity, distinctiveness, and a specific aesthetic. Got it. And, you know, I completely agree that anyone who's in any urban area will know what you're talking about, whether it's, yeah, the cool craft brewer people meet, the cool cocktail bar with where every single cocktail has a little name for itself, a little story, um, and usually a certain aesthetic that the staff tend to wear. So that we make sure our audience has a really strong sense of why this phenomenon is interesting at all. Can you describe what you call the hipster paradox? I think this really gets to why the other you, you, the utter ubiquity of this notion of the hipster authenticity yes. is so interesting. Yes, I mentioned you know, in the first page of the book that at the beginning of my PhD, I was quite scared you know, to become you know, the sociologist of uh, gourmet burgers or you know, of a street food. Sure. You know, 
my interest was in analyzing, you know, contemporary capitalist transformations. My in my main interest as an academic has always been to analyze the complex relationship between how uh, industrial society and capitalism and at large uh, alienates individuals and how individuals always seek ways to escape from this alienation and to find spaces of self-determination and self-expression. What I found especially interesting about the hipster economy is that even a topic as frivolous, apparently as, again, you know, craft uh, beers, uh, cocktails, or uh, typical food, can tell us a lot about how capitalism is transforming today, late modern capitalism is transforming, and how middle class people especially are trying to escape from the alienating features of the industrial society and of capitalism. I discuss of the hipster paradox that you mentioned, uh, also mm -hmm. because I discuss about the hipster economy, but this is not a book about hipsters. This is a book about all of us and how, if we want, we have all become a little bit hipsterists in our consumption. Hipsters have become you know, a mocking trope, if we want. You no, know? It is just a way you go out with friends and you tell your friend, oh, come on, how hipster you are wearing that clothes, or how hipster you are for taking that uh, drink. Or, oh, yes, I know I'm an hipster too. I took this. I went to, I invited you to this restaurant. And this is why I think that the hipster paradox, the fact that, you know, uh, hipsters are the people who doesn't consider themselves hipsters because hipsters look for authenticity and distinctiveness. But naturally, they will be, you know, uh, they are considered fake some way in their search for authenticity and distinctiveness. The actual solution to the hipster paradox is not to take some people and apply to them the label of hipsters against their will, because it's very difficult you know, to imagine a subculture where which members refuse to be members of a subculture. But actually, the solution to the hipster paradox of the contradictory search and quest for authenticity is to recognize that due to the impending paradigm of authenticity in taste, due to the ubiquity of this economy, we have all become, again, a little bit hipsterist in our consumption when we look for the typical restaurant selling or a typical food from a specific region or source directly from the producers. We go to a coffee place because it roasts coffee from some uh, authentic place, or we go to a cocktail bar, which serves an exclusive list of drinks, or that crafts, of, or in which the mixologist crafts a cocktail tailored upon you, and you don't have the usual gin and tonic or the usual spritz. So. Kind of piggybacking off that, you mentioned that we are all kind of, we are all a little bit hipster because broadly speaking, we're looking to have a feeling of community against alienation. Use the word alienation. And one thing I like so much about the book was that, you know, I think we all know it's easy to sort of parody the hipster, the show Portlandia, the entire joke of the show is parodying hipsters, but your book has a, has a more sympathetic and inquisitive tone. And so I'd love if you could talk about where does this, what is this sense of alienation? Where does it come from? And why are we trying to escape it? Yes, thank you. Um, I like this question because it allows me to introduce one of my big passions, which is history. Here, person, a brief personal note. I am a sociologist, but I probably always wanted to be a historian in my life. So I put history and historical analysis in everything I do. And I think it's always valuable to gain historical depth and have uh, what I call in the book, taking that from uh, uh, Fernand Brodel, long durée vision of history, because it allows you to 
see how history repeats itself. What we think is absolutely new has actually very deep roots. This idea of escaping from, from the alienation of the industrial society actually has very deep roots from the beginning of the industrial society to today. And in the first chapter of the book, that may be, may be more, you know, uh, boring in some terms, but also, you know, going more in depth historically and looking also at, histor at authors, philosophers from Jean-Jacques Rousseau onwards, I try to recollect how you know, this sense of escaping from how industrial society uh, alienates us has been present from the 19th century of today. And I think that one of the very valuable aspects that the hipster economy tells us, being it the last iteration of the attempt by mainly the middle class to escape from the alienation of capitalism and industrial life, is that despite capitalism in the last 50 years has desperately tried to convince individuals that we live in a post-industrial society, and here I'm using post-industrial you know, in a specific sense, you no know, meaning that we live in a society that has overcome the main uh, dangers and negative externalities of uh, Fordism and industrialism, so uh, pollution, work exploitation, dullness of leisure and of consumption, we actually still much live in an industrial society, just different. And the fact that this hipster economy, the idea of having authentic consum consumption experiences has become so, so ubiquitous is, you know, is the best proof that actually people are still looking for ways to find some self-expression and self-determination and pleasure in the interstices of the capitalist system. There's a lot there that I can unpack from, <laughs> you know, I, I love the stuff about Rousseau, but what I want to really point out is one thing that came out of your answer as well as in the book is that there's this sort of almost contradiction or paradox in that, yes, we all know how much modern, especially tech companies, have this ethos of we promote work-life balance. We understand you don't, you're, you're a person, not just a worker. And so, you know, they do purport to have this sort of more humane yeah, ethos, working model, but in reality, they're still beholden to shareholder value. It's still a capitalist society. But you also talk about in the book how in many ways it is different. And that in so far as hipsters are sort of obje ob objecting to industrial society, in many ways that doesn't apply to modern times. So what I'm asking is in what ways is our modern economic system the same as industrial society and how is it different? Wow, this is a big and difficult question, <laughs> but thank you for it. I like it a lot. I mean, it is the same because again, I think we still live in an industrial society where again, more, a lot of the claims of uh, artisanal food and typical food actual come from large corporations and large companies that are exploiting this trend that because again in the last 50 years what has also happened is that capitalism has appropriated the ideal has tried to appropriate the ideal of authenticity and of distinctiveness of life experiences so what has changed is that you know, uh, industrial production now desperately tries to frame themselves as non-industrial. Uh, it's engaged in a much more complex play and game of disguise, if we want. Mm. It is, uh, it, it's all about, you know, the food in the supermarket shelves. It's all about it to frame it as it directly comes from the farmer, even if we know it's not. And consumers are not stupid. Individuals are not stupid. We know that actually, despite the picture of the cow on the butter, for example, no, there is an incredibly long logistic chain and production chain. But still, some way, uh, we 
we uh, companies know that that symbolic imaginary, what in the book I call a neocraft imaginary, is very valuable to be put at use. So I think this is what has changed. It has changed also how individuals seek to escape from alienation in society. Uh, the hip, what I always argue is, you know, among when in the 60s and the 70s, the first, a first wave of autonomous workers emerged in you know, the global north at the wake of the new post-Fordist model they were populated by a lot of people who were protagonists of the revolts of the 60s and the 70s. Because, well, I mean, you know, Marx tells us that alienation derives from employee work, salaried work, and so if I become an autonomous worker, I will be freed from alienation because I will become, you know, the, you know, the owner of my own labor. We know that that's not what happened, okay? But still... The idea and the fact the, the the creative and liberating potential of autonomous work still lives for the neocraft entrepreneurs who populate the hipster economy. Naturally, at the same time, they are children of neoliberalism. They are children of the last 50 years. They are embedded in this society. I think that as sociologists, as academics, we are often very prone to uh, criticize and to pinpoint the contradictions you know, in, uh, in other categories you know, of workers, saying, oh yes, you can see, and sure, uh, neocraft entrepreneurs have high ethical values and cultural goals, but then look at that, they are contradictory. Truth is, we all live in a capitalist society, so we are all embedded in the contradictions of the system. Yeah. And we, you, you can't escape from them. But the neocraft entrepreneurs are, are a category that with their limits and with their uh, uh, benefits are trying to navigate the contemporary economy how they can, trying to do something good for the community. This has some limits, but I think that it is also has some valuable aspect that must be recognized. And the same is true for the consumer side. So if I understand correctly, the idea here is that, of course, it's easy for us to say, hey, these neocraft entrepreneurs, as you call them, are hypocritical. They claim to have this very sort of DIY feel to them, yet they're still funded by VCs or whatever it might be. Um, but we can understand that they're, they're doing what they can within the constraints of the economic environment that we live in. Did you? Great. Yes. So, yes. So one thing you talk about in the book a lot is how, as a sort of response to this conundrum, the hipster aesthetic gets anchored in the past to a kind of pre-industrial world that may or may not have actually existed. So can you speak to, to that, that aspect of the aesthetic? Yes, sure. And again, what is interesting is that this anchoring in the past is something come on to the hipster economy today as it is come on to the arts and crafts movement between the 19th and the 28th century and also to Jean-Jacques Rousseau's idea you know, of the savage uh, one century before. So again, we see the continuities and the, the, how history repeats itself in new ways how it is anchored in the past, the hipster economy, because basically uh, uh, Professor Chris Land, which is, has been among the first to discuss neocraft industries, has called it a movement back to the future. Now, uh, it, basically it uses the idea or the imaginary of a mythicized pre-industrial past made of you know, still untouched by the alienation of industrial society and uh, so made of uh, authentic and genuine social relations, for example, at the urban level, but also of food that actually tasted like food, <laughs> food that was actually tasty, uh, old uh, typical productions, you know, before industrial uh, production uh, homogenized 
uh, the production of uh, raw materials. So it it appeals to that past, but it is not a conservative because it appeals to that past to actually envision post-capitalist, or at least in the more conscious versions, okay, post-capitalist futures and imagining post-capitalist economies or more broadly at a more diffused and less conscious level still a post-industrial futures in which again it will be possible to have this kind of genuine food authentic consumption experiences authentic social relations uh, i think that the, the fact that my empirical research was based in Italy helped me with that with this because differently from other contexts, Italy had a very an extremely uh, strong but also very short industrialization, very quick industrialization. Now, in the 30s, Italy was still a mainly agrarian you know, uh, the country, and in the 50s and 60s and 70s, it quickly became in 30 years a full industrial uh, society and a full industrial country. So, and this is why, for example, Italy is benefiting so much by this new paradigm of authentic consumption. Why Italy now has become so fancy for food, for beverage, for drinks, for tourism, precisely because having been the industrialization process quicker, it's easier to recall and to recover mythicized versions that are always mythicized and fictional versions, naturally, are imaginaries, again, our economic imaginaries of the past in order to imagine a better future quality of life. So you said that Italy has been a winner in this modern hipster aesthetic in a way that makes a lot of sense, which is that their agrarian lifestyle is kind of recent in their memory. It's recent in the world's memory. Italian food is romanticized. The Italian lifestyle is very romanticized. We hear about it all the time. But I like the idea of calling Italy a winner. Can you be more specific and say more about with this modern hipster mode of consumption, who are the winners and losers? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not sure who are the winners and losers. What I can say is, I hope that the winners, I hope that this new paradigm of consumption, despite corporate attempts to, you know, to appropriate it, will favor and will benefit small and independent business models and networks of small and independent retailers. Uh, and I think that there this model can support this kind of experiences. It, small uh, businesses that are also uh, rooted in their neighborhoods, that does not just you know sell products and offer services, but also are involved in the social and cultural fabric of their areas, that they bring on cultural projects, social projects. I think that the, the, this paradigm gives them opportunities and I hope that this may bring. Naturally, it will all depend, as always, is a matter of conflicts between different forces and between different pushes. A push to the uh, appropriation of this for just profit-making purposes and a push of putting this for the benefit of individuals. And for the sec and for this second push, I think that a fundamental challenge that we haven't touched upon a lot up until now, but it, it is fundamental, I think, is the affordability of these models. Because I, I've mentioned it a couple of times, but this is mainly a middle class escape route from alienation in late modern capitalism. And this is because these kind of places, this kind of consumption requires both some levels of economic capital and also some level of cultural capital. You need to be, you need to have the proper refined taste 
to appreciate a special cocktail or a special craft beer or a special, you know, a typical food from a region. And that also, I think, has to tell us a lot, can tell us a lot about the new divide that is widely felt in society between, you know, middle class and working class, population, etc. So I think that a fundamental challenge, if we want this to benefit the majority of individuals, is that the big and main obstacle is to win the challenge of aff the affordability of what we call craft or artisanal or authentic, as we want, products, objects of consumption. So if the fundamental challenge of this neo-craft movement actually paving the way for a truly better post, post Fortis, post, post industrial future, if the biggest challenge is affordability, and I think that's very relatable to people. I think everyone has this sense that, ah, uh, you live in a city that ha that's kind of mixed income. Once that first hipster coffee shop comes in three years later, the locals are pushed out. I and mean, I think there is a sort of cynical view right now on the phenomenon you're talking about. So do you have any thoughts on how this affordability problem, as you called it, can be solved? Because I think that people, I think you'd agree with this, the neocraft entrepreneurs themselves don't want to gentrify. They have actual ideals. So what do you think they need to do to solve this affordability problem? Well, I don't have an easy answer to that. Otherwise, I would offer my services Fair. for a very high prices. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, but no, I think that you're right. I completely agree with what you said, and I completely agree also with the issue of gentrification, which is one of the most relevant ones, but also about the issue of the aesthetization of food traditions. No, because what the Neocraft movement is doing is to take popular food, popular recipes, and basically gourmetizing them because consumers think they want the, the real taste from the pre-industrial past, but they don't really want that taste. They want gourmetized versions of them. No? And as always, I think one answer, even if there is no easy answer, because we know like gentrifying coalitions are very strong and very powerful. Large corporations exploiting the work of small and independent business owners to marketize industrial products or craft are very powerful. But as always, I think that a first answer always lie in building networks. Building networks, getting together, creating associations, building platforms, if we need, in the digital age, in which first... Because naturally, you know, like with union comes the strength, with union comes, you know, the different dimensions of scale at which you can exert your power, but also because we need networks, because if I have to do, if I have to put one critic, you no, know, let's say, you no, know, to the uh, neo-craft entrepreneurs is that often the fact that, okay, these forces are above our head is also a very nice excuse to not actually deal with the issue. Now, okay, gentrification is not our problem. We don't want it, but it's not our problem because they are real estate investors, which are the bad people. And so in this way, you also have a very nice and comfortable from personal moral point of view, excuse and justification but you are not actually dealing with the problem. We need networks, not only because the union makes the strength, but also because we need collective critical reflections on this. We need the people animating this economy and also the consumers, the citizens living in these neighborhoods, because still people get into these neighborhoods because they are a nice place to live when you have, where you have good quality of life up until the moment you can still afford the rent. And so, yes, we need a lot of collective reflections, collective discussions about how can we keep these and make these more affordable. I love that. And I love what you said about how people are going to have to do the, the admittedly hard work of not of not saying, hey, look, it's the landlord's fault. It's not my fault. It's the VC's fault. I, it's, a, it's a great point. And that's actually a good transition to a question I had, which is, you know, many people have noticed that 
hippie and hipster both have hip in the name and the term hip has a rich history. And at the same time, you're talking about how this hipster movement can really be positive, but face the supportability challenge. And I also think to draw a sort of a parallel, there's much discussion in the zeitgeist about what the hippies accomplished. Were, did the hippies kind of save America? Did Were they this amazing kind of peacekeeping force uh, against the Vietnam War? Or did the hippies sort of, were they just hedonists? Did they end up just taking power? So how does the hipster movement relate to the hippie movement? And what did the successes and the failures of the hippies, what can that tell us about? Yeah, no, I, I, again, I love this question because, again, it allows me you know, to bring some historical parallel that I say that I love a lot. And there is definitely, I mean, you know, I, in, you know, if we go, the hippies of the 60s you know, were the, the maturity point of a number of countercultures that grew, especially in America, but also you know, in other places uh, of the global north, against Fordism, you know, against the standard, the, like the blatant standardization broke by Fordism to everyday people life. You no know? consumption, can, all can, the same. Can I try to quickly? It just so, to make sure everyone understands, can you quickly define Fordism? You're right. Apologies for that. Yes. When I discuss of Fordism, I relate to a previous model of capitalist uh, organization, which was based on the idea of standardized production much more than today. Uh, while in the last 50 years, capitalism may have shifted towards a much more tailored model. Mm -hmm. So Fordism takes its name you known from the famous Ford T, you know, in which at the beginning of the 20th century, you know, say, well, it's a Ford T, it's black. That's it. You don't need no specific, no, you need no uh, the personalization on that. And in the 50s and the 60s, where the effects of standardized production and a standardized society, also from a working a consumption, from all the points of view, become more and more apparent, these countercultures came and then a hippies movement came. And the fact is, uh, the hippies signaled, had the benefit of signaling that, you know, that was unbearable that couldn't be uh, sustained anymore. And it's not casual, the fact that this was a real, white was a global movement. In the US, you had the hippies that was more cultural. In Italy and Europe, you had more political movements. You no know, young people getting political into the streets. Sometimes, unfortunately, no, also in, you know, with armed struggle, but also, you know, in alliances with workers movement, you had the same revolt in the East under Soviet Union, because even if Soviet Union was outside, you no, know, cap the capitalist world, it was still a very much industrialized and Fordist society and standardized society. And they signaled that that was not bearable anymore. And what has, and the, and then you had the hippies, and then you had, you know, uh, the bobos in, you know, in the eighties that were more these yuppies, you no, know? and then you had the indies, and you had, you, you always had new generations of uh, countercultures or subcultures signaling this and signaling their, uh, you know that the necessity of being alternative mm. to that mainstream made of standardization. The fact has been that in the meanwhile, the same capitalist structuring of society has shifted towards the same model of being tailored upon the individual, being personalized and being distinctive and not anymore standardized. So what we have today and what is the big difference between, you know, the, the the hipsterist middle class of today and the hippies of the 60s and the 70s is that when today we want to be alternative to the mainstream, we are actually referring, even if we are not always aware of that, 
to an old paradigm, the one of standardization that has already become quite obsolete. And we are in, instead already part of a new paradigm of being distinctive, authentic, etc., that has also been appropriated by capitalism. Okay, that is an absolutely perfect transition to my last question. So to set the stage, right. I love what you said that in a, in a model, in a Fordist industrial society where standardization really was the norm, then being counterculture, countercultural, stressing your own uniqueness really was a form of protest, whether, you know, directly or indirectly. But in the modern era, um, especially with things like Instagram, social media, where actually uniqueness and authenticity are commodified, it can feel almost impossible to be yourself. It can feel almost possible. When you say, um, when I'm, I don't know, when I'm hosting some piece of art I made on Instagram and I'm whatever it might be, it can feel like, am I doing this because I'm sort of discovering myself or am I doing this because I'm trying to commodify my personality? So as a piece of advice to the listeners, how do you yourself try to stay authentic and unique in the modern world? And to another way to ask the question is, what do you think modern political action looks like in this modern world? Okay. Okay. Yes. I like this again, because I think it is, I absolutely agree with you. I have, and again, this is the precisely the outcome of authenticity still being both a powerful tool for appropriation and at the same time, a still alive ideal of emancipation. No. And I think this is paramount no, to uh, to understand. Uh, I think that you know, um, I don't think that you know the important thing is to be authentic. No, I think the important thing is again at the opposite. What I think is that being fifty years that capitalism has tried to appropriate this ideal. Today we focused on the consumption aspect, but if we look at the working aspect in corporations is the same, all the gamifica gamification and play thing. And in every aspect of society, it has happened like that. No, uh, it is quite soon, I think, the moment in which the ideal of authenticity as that will lose value. Because what we learn from capitalism history is not only that capitalism is very good at appropriating any protest against uh, it, but that is also extremely good at depleting all these concepts they appropriate of their countercultural, of their radical meanings to make them empty shells. You know, the idea of, again, uh, the parallel to, to the work field, you know, the idea of having a work that is also a play, a game, was a very powerful idea. Now it has become many times almost a nightmare because, oh no, no, my boss wants me to play at work. Oh God, the same is kind of happening with authenticity in consumption. What I still think remains paramount is what stands behind the ideal of authenticity and that stays true from the beginning of the industrial society. The ideal of freedom to self-determination to self-expression and to distinctive life experiences. And I think that political action to, again, should not much be interested in, in purity, in how to reach some pure state, but on how we can build collective spaces, collective safe spaces where we can enjoy these elements and these features how we can collectively work towards a society in which it is possible to, to self-determine, to self-express yourself in, in a way that everyone can, not just a few people. And again, I return to the challenge of affordability. In this way, I think that the small and independent businesses of the hipster economy can be a component of this movement. They often... They are also very often social spaces, cultural spaces, organizing events, doing action in the neighborhood. Naturally, they cannot be considered, you know, they're not a panacea. 
okay, for this. They're not an easy solution if we think that the hippie businesses or the neocraft industries will do this shift alone. We will be total fools. No one saves themselves alone. <laughs> you can always save yourself building coalitions between different actors. The neocraft industries can be one piece of the puzzle, one piece of the mosaic. That's what I think. Are there any, I know I said this last question, but just as one final yes. addendum to that, are there any, given any economic or technological headwinds we see developing in 2024 in the next few years, are there any specific challenges or opportunities that you hope Neocraft Industries in partnership with the individual can play a role against? Yes. I mean, again, I think that, you know, this is still like an open, an open field for conflict, if you want. Mm -hmm. And I think that for sure, for example, the digital aspect, I think is fundamental that you mentioned because we haven't touched upon this, but you know, the digital can be a fundamental dimension for these businesses to grow and to make them known at the same time can be a multiplier of the aesthetic and commercializing pushes of the, of the, of, of authenticity, because you are forced again, as you, uh, you before you made the example of Instagram, no, uh, if you go now on Instagram, on the reels or on TikTok with the videos, no, you will be submerged of, you know, authentic street food businesses, etc., showing the food. And actually there, the aesthetic becomes much more significant than the cultural values, that the ethical values. Now, what matters is the bright colors. What matters is the ASMR sound. Now, the, the aesthetic prevails over the content. I think that a fundamental challenge is to keep the content. I think another fundamental opportunity and challenge is to, is a politicization of this movement in relation with the other political movements that are emerging. I mean, we are assisting, you know, also here, we can always identify waves you know, of politicization of society and of depoliticization of society. After the big ebb from politics of the 80s you know, and the 90s, we are now assisting to a new politicization of society, a new many conflicts. You know, we see movements, social movements, environmental movements, you know, our own uh, social justice movements, I think that there is much to be gained uh, to, inter to interact with this, to bring forward. And also, a final point I would like to make is authenticity is a very, is a deeply Western concept. It, again, it starts from Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Pascal and the Romantic movement, it, it is deeply embedded in Western history and Western industrialization. And it is now the, the paradigm of authenticity today is global because Western capitalism has been globalized you know, in the last century. But at the same time, I think there could be such a lot to learn from different concepts, from different ways of frame the quest for self-expression, self-determination that may come from the global south, from different cultures, and that we and that may be also excellent opportunities to overcome some of the drawbacks of the ideal of authenticity. For example, again, the individual dimension of it, the deeply uh, middle class dimension of it. I think there can be much to be grasped by this kind of uh, the, uh, projects. I and I really look forward to read future projects, probably by other scholars, 
from the global south were talking about, you know, decolonizing the idea of authenticity, for high finding new ways of expressing the same concepts, etc. Or at least putting that into a dialogue. I think that is a perfect, inspiring way to leave us. So, Alessandro Jarosa, thank you so much for your time. Thanks to you, and thanks to the listeners that hopefully have remained with us up to the end of the podcast.